to share more. Happy Nita. and I am from the Ngāti Pikiao tribe in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And um, we literally, me and my crew and my niece, just got off the plane about 90 minutes ago. <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> this is like the crown jewel in a tour that we did. We opened in Auckland and Auckland, New Zealand yesterday morning to celebrate Mother's Day. Flew down to our capital in Wellington in an afternoon screening there. Jumped on a plane, crossed the date line, Mother's Day again here in America. <laughs> and we made it! We actually made it here! <laughs> no one missed the plane. There were delays, but they enabled us to get on our next plane. So it's, uh, this is insane for me right now. It's, it's, it's surreal. Uh, it's also a homecoming for me. Myself and my niece lived here in Beverly Hills for a few years while my mother and my father were working here in Hollywood. And um, so it's quite fitting that we come back here, I, I think. Uh, amongst a lot of familiar faces I see in this audience on this auspicious Mother's Day to celebrate a mother and to celebrate mothers everywhere. Um, I just really, really wanted to thank Array for giving uh, my family the support and the platform to share our mother's story. I don't know that in her lifetime she would ever receive the type of audience that of the scale that Array could give us. Um, so it's a tremendous honor to be associated with, with Ava and for us to be associated with that. So I'm sincerely grateful um, to have that opportunity. I'm also really grateful uh, to share this evening with you all for coming here. I'll be back after the film with my producers, Cliff Curtis, Chelsea Lewis Stanley, and a few other friends uh, associated with the film. So please enjoy and stick around after the screening. Hi folks. Hey. 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 My name is Amy Duvernay. I'm Her name is Chelsea Lynn Stanley. 
family, and she's here. Today. Fresh off the plane. Look at her. <laughs> With that LAX glow. <laughs> the director of this piece, I loved um, just learning about his family and watching the history of the filmmaker through his eyes, the love and care of a son. Happy meet us here. Of, you know, maternity and nurture and love, 
and that's what we knew her as. And I was the youngest of my generation, or her grandchildren, um, they were very much part of our household as well. And she brought them up, but like she would take them from my brothers and my sister, and they would be like little kids in the house with me. So they were like my little siblings. And that was our household. And she would go to work and she would do her thing, and that was work. You know, that wasn't anything that she'd come home and tell us about. And I think um, it kind of goes back to what you were saying about working in an American Hollywood environment. But even back in New Zealand, um, you work in the industry and it's so far removed from where she came from. And so spending time with children was her way of grounding herself and getting back down to earth. And that was kind of how I felt my role was throughout her life was, you know, uh, she was obviously nurturing and loving mom, but it was also, you know, a, a place that she could be where she didn't have to deal with um, a lot of bullshit. Um, so that was my relationship and that's how I knew her. It wasn't until after she passed away that I really got into the specifics of things. Like I knew she was fierce. Like I, I saw her, like, you know, when she was angry about something, you knew, right? And she could shut people down here very, very quickly. <laughs> um, and I knew that I remember as a kid asking her what she did for a job because I saw her order people around and like everybody would listen and I'd go and do what she said. You know, as a kid that leaves uh, an impression on you. But other than that, I didn't, I didn't really know all that much about her. Um, I took for granted that she would be around forever, you know, so it wasn't a conversation that I ever thought to, to have with her either. Um, and it wasn't until looking through the archival films that I, like, Met her as the younger woman and then saw those things that she went through. And um, could you two down the end there? <laughs> so I think when I was up here about, about your, not, not just with the involvement of how you came to the film, because um, I was quite interested in this good relationship with her. So, um, yeah. Um, I was working with Nancy when she passed away. We were making a film about child abuse in the United community. So um, I kind of got to know her personally later on in her life. I had came to know her though through her work earlier on in my twenties, I suppose, when I was wanting to be a documentary filmmaker, and I came across actually Point Day 507, which is one of the films in there. Um, which is about Indigenous and rights. And I just remember watching that film and crying and crying, not being able to stop, and just knowing in the pit of my stomach there was something that was on screen in front of me that had been told in such a way that moved me. And I just always thought to myself, who on earth had the guts to be able to tell that story that way? And I never ever thought I would get to meet someone like her ever in my life. So when I did, um, I felt like my whole life kind of changed and my whole involvement with the film changed. And then having to work, uh, having the opportunity to work with her later on up until she passed was, yeah, a really good highlight of my career today. And then being asked by Cliff and Hippie, it was one of those um, moments they were in Wellington one day and I was like, I'll come have a coffee to Cafe and they just sat me down and I got me up to. And then we just finished what we were in the shadows and kind of being a mom as well. We had a little baby who was here, so we don't know now. Where is it? Um, <laughs> 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 oh, you're still in there. I'm just trying to do it. 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 I'm just
Uh, originally, I was fascinated by her. I wanted to make a feature film about her and life. When she passed suddenly, it wasn't until the same, after her funeral, um, there was an unveiling. And Henry, I think this is where the genesis of the film really happened. He made a 12 minute clip for his family as an expression, just a pure expression of his love for his mother, for his family to view of clips of her talking through different phases of her life. And that's really the film that Henry really created in a 12 minute form, just pure love for his mother and for his family. And I think the light went off and I thought, okay. Then, then I enrolled and engaged. But really, it really did come out as well. Genuine feel love for the real film, and that's where the film came from. Um, yeah, I think I must could have made this film. It just doesn't feel like anyone else. I remember. I'm not sure if they believe in public ever parties, but at any session, if anyone else should be you know, involved in anything, because it's your first feature, because and you actually make a doc, this is quite something that petrifies me. Um, I just don't have a good bit. But um, how much footage, how much stuff do you have to go through? Because there's, I mean, there must have been there's tons of, of interviews and, and pieces that are out there, and also have worked as well. Um, yeah, it was actually five years in the making from from beginning when we had that conversation um, with Cliff and Chelsea. But um, even before that, I mean, I, I actually did work in the film archive. And so um, when my mother passed away, she had like band loads of film material just at the house. We took that to the film archive, they took one look at it and it was like, do you want a job? <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was the beginning of of this, really. And it was a good couple of years before this was even thought of as an idea for a film, where it was actually just me trying to come to terms with my own grief and be close to my mother, because this was my way of hearing her voice again. This was my way of seeing what she looked like as a younger woman. And also, this was my way of seeing my older siblings as children, because we didn't have any family photos from, from back in the day, you know? So I watched them grow up in, in her films. And so people are watching her films these, for example, the political statements, and I'm there like playing, where's all the other people my old brother? <laughs> but that was really the, the heart, that was really the genesis of this project, was, was me going through that. And when Cliff approached me, it was like, he gave me like the Godfather ultimatum. He's like, hey, I'm starting a production company, I want to do a project on your mom, and I want you to direct it. And if you don't want to direct it, then I'm not going to do it. And I was like, Okay, that's the offer I can refuse. There's, there's no way I'm going to say no to that. So it was a huge challenge for me to make a knock. I mean, I didn't go into this wanting to make a film about my mother. But I did know that there was interest, and I did know eventually that someone would want to do that. But I thought, in order for it to be authentic, um, particularly for someone like her who started off in the industry as a solo mother of five, you know, the, the perspective of the children should be the key to, to telling that story. Yeah, as, uh, I'm always struck with how, especially nowadays, when you wake up and there's just a new petition to sign, an email, an inbox, you know, something. But it's like the most effort most of us will do is to either delete that email or make a big effort and go and go, yeah, I support whatever this is. But back then, um, it's, what really strikes me with the film was seeing a woman, and it was a woman in that, in that time, who would get up and go out and actually get in the front lines and the protests and actually do something. But yeah, for some of the things, there's no question for your mind, so I just think it's very important and cool and inspiring. That was what was crazy about it for me watching this. I was like, why is it that the most important historic events in New Zealand history, why is it up to a solo mother of five to be the one to tell these stories? Like, where is everybody else? What are you doing? Well, it's as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who was it that was on like holding film cans stuff? Like, how many blue bags? Yeah, yeah, no, there was a whole network of people stashing them away from her, but like hiding it from the police because they were coming to raid the house. So there was like a whole network of people within Auckland and across New Zealand hiding them away so that she can make this work happen. It's incredible. And like, so the government was um, got a time, uh, I promise, to uh, 
you know nothing um, like you know um, some kind of weird thing like this in power. But he started this, he started this thing with Red Squad, which was this branch of the police, which had come, when I think would do whatever they wanted without any permit, set why they could come and raid Meadows' house and drag the kids out of the street and at 3 a.m. and make them stand out on the street while they like harassed her and ran up to her in the entire house looking for film, film reels because she was in the front lines of these protests filming them. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it really shows the courage of women, and if we think about who are behind movements, it is women. Who's behind Time's Up? Who's behind Me Too? It's women. Um, I'm going to start throwing it out to the audience. Uh, <laughs> short form questions. Suggestion. <laughs> and so I did. Compliments are amazing, we all love compliments, but for the discussion to keep going, make sure the compliment kind of goes up at the end of the series. <laughs> 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 So the question was, um, there were some issues uh, getting rights for some of this archival footage. And um, so beyond, beyond the personal aspect of, of delving into my family's story, the greatest challenge in telling my mom's story was actually securing the rights of the recordings of her. So her own work was fairly straightforward to some degree. But when you're dealing with national broadcasting companies who have recorded an interview of her, and they're wanting to charge you over a hundred dollars a second per second for reuse of your own mother's interview. Wow. That's when you have a major issue on your hands. Um, and this is a thing that's ongoing from this documentary, and one of the organizations I work with in New Zealand are really pushing back against those types of policies. So, you know, we talk about decolonizing the screen. I mean, colonization on the screen is very evident in that very policy. Um, and this is something that New Zealand filmmakers and Māori filmmakers in particular come up against quite often when trying to document our history. And it's a really strange position to be in when you're talking about like commodifying you know, your history, commodifying your mother and, and family. How much is your mother's image and words worth to you? You know, are you going to shout out hundred dollars per second for a little thing? Uh, and I mean, and the other aspect of that too is it's a creative imposition in that we could only afford so much footage, so we had to be very particular about the, the parts that we wanted to use. Um, so that, that is one of the major struggles, and that, that is an ongoing thing. We are working together at the moment on an educational resource and freeing up the rights from some of that work so we could package these things together and deliver them as an entire piece, with the documentary being one aspect of, uh, of a filmography. Um, but yes, that is, a, that, is, that is a struggle that continues in New Zealand right now. that I wanted to know about my mother um, that I never got to ask her and is there anything now that I'd like to, to you know, ask her about? And I think for the second part of that, I mean, now that the film has been released um, and now that the film has been picked up by Ray and is on Netflix and we've done a nationwide release in New Zealand, um, it's interesting because a lot more people will be finding out about my mom's story after she passed away than they ever did while she was alive. And, you know, I really want to ask her you know, how she feels about that. Did she ever expect her story to be so widespread? Did she ever expect herself to be so um, revered in my life? Because, you know, when she was first starting out, being the only woman of colour on TV in New Zealand, being the only woman of colour making films in New Zealand and making the types of films that she was making, she was uh, a target for a lot of prejudice and a lot of... 
um, hatred. Um, so there were times where she didn't feel loved, and there were times that she felt very lonely. And I really wish that she would have had the opportunity to see how many, like, look at this packed out theater now, and all these people that, you know, some of these people here may have never, never heard of a Maori filmmaker before, or even a Maori, or even know when you see what it is. But they're here <laughs> and they're here. I love the story and, and celebrating it. And, you know, I, I would really love to know if she ever expected that in, in her lifetime. And um, there's some more personal questions too, because I remember like some of her um, brothers and sisters came and saw the film, and they were in tears afterwards, and I was so nervous um, about it, because we dealt into some family history here, and they were like, maybe we love the film. Now there's some secrets that you probably should have told. <laughs> And, and just things like that, because you know, my mom was very private. So um, there, there are those things that I always wonder, you know, would she feel comfortable with the world knowing about these things? Um, yeah, and uh, you know, I, I really would like to know what she thinks of where we are at now, and have things even changed from the time when she was fighting for the things that she was fighting for? Because definitely in some areas, um, things have changed for the better, and I'm very proud of that. But there's all the conversations that we're having today about exploitation of women in the film industry, about um, land rights, particularly, you know, what's going on like with the Dakota Pipeline here and those types of things. And, you know, what, what has changed and how she feels about that? Those are the questions that I think about now. That was such a beautiful question. I think you deserve a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs>
of color or women filmmakers who will share them with audiences who are inquisitive and dynamic and forward thinking like you. We're not asking you for money, but I am asking you to help us get the word out about this picture. It's on Netflix right now and it's playing here in other country, in, uh, in other cities around the country all month. And we want to continue to tour it uh, throughout the country through the summer. Libraries, colleges, organ small organizations, art houses. Delaine Jones and her team, they call, they beg, they push, but it takes the audience to say we want it. So if you do not follow Array now on Twitter or Instagram, follow us on uh, Facebook as well. And tell your friends to come and see this film. And if you don't want to come to the theater, just watch it on Netflix and rate it and like it and share it. She deserves to be known. How many yeah. of you knew about her? I did not until I watched this film. And I'm a woman filmmaker who's all about this. I did not know about her. That can't be. So you are our evangelists, you are our soldiers, our warriors, our mouthpieces in Los Angeles. Please help us get the word out however you can. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I'd be safe. And